Is it Sheila? Sorry? Is she on the show? Uh, we just want to do what we want. You will see later on. Uh, <laughs> I just want to give links. Um, thanks for coming along. Um, before I start, we're running a little bit low on lightning talk ideas, so everyone pipe up. We need more submissions. We need more. Um, next week, Mark um, is talking about big data using ToadDB and MySQL. Cool. But I'm here to talk about physical web, uh, walk up and use anything. So at the moment, we have things like Internet of Things. I hate that. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and also we have Internet of Everything. And actually it's all just connected devices. That's what it is. So at the moment, in 2015, we have 4.9 billion connected devices around the world. Gartner, which is one of the big uh, companies looking at this area, they're expecting that in 2020, there's going to be 25 billion connected devices. And we need a way to interact with all of these devices. So what are we doing at the moment? We push dirty buttons on vending machines and things like that. I don't know why. We just person puts their balls and stuff. <laughs> so the other way that then um, came up is we use phones. We call awesome text messages to pay for these services. And this is all kind of good until someone does this and talks about the phone number. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome. Um, so what else we do? Uh, we type in a URL, which looks like this, and takes about 15 minutes. Or we use a shortener, which looks like that. The URLs are usually on little stickers, and that URL is actually missing. So you actually never know where you're going to end up when you type that URL in. Uh, these are ranked from the worst to the best scenario, I guess, at the moment, how we do things. Um, we can use QR codes, it's quite handy, uh, except most of the time they're like this. <laughs> <laughs> Which is less than it. Um, and the final one is uh, we install apps. But Every vending machine will have a different app. Every you know, train station will have a different app, and, and so on and so forth. So you just end up with billions of apps, and if the amount of connected devices is going to grow like it's expected to, uh, it's basically unsustainable. So then, physical web. Um, so these are a couple of the things, the taglines. So people should be able to walk up to any smart device and not have to download an app first. Love it and everything should be just a tap away. So, what is physical web? It's an open standard. It's built around URLs, and it uses existing technology. So if you go through them, so it's an open standard. It was started by some of the Google engineers, but it's not a Google product. Um, they are constantly releasing it now. They're doing early iterations. They're releasing it for people so they can experiment with it. They can chat about it. And they're trying to build it into a new standard. And it's open source. Um, and it's on GitHub, so anyone can go, anyone can read it, play with it, join the conversation, and help the, um, develop it. So why are we using URLs for this? Um, URLs can lead to simple information. It can be, you know, you go to a museum or something like that, and you can get the visitor's guide or something like that. It can just show you basic information. Uh, they can be interactive apps. We can build stuff that actually interact with the real world, or does something for you, um, and we can do that using URLs, because it just leads to a website. But URLs also can deep link into native experiences. So we can uh, create links that, um, well, we create applications and deep link into them so your application can respond um, with its own features to something that's happening. Um, the technology it uses, it uses Bluetooth 4.0 low power mode. You can also use Wi Fi, uh, a little bit, yeah, about that. But Bluetooth 4.0 power is great. And it uses the internet. And that's the tech it uses. So it's pretty uh, widespread already. So I obviously created this 
myself in the interview from the internet. So the way it works is you have the URL beacon, and that advertises the URL for your service. Your physical web app then um, scans for beacons and finds the URLs. It then it sends them to a server which resolves them for you, displays them to you, and you click on it, and it's a solvent smart pack. Um, and after that, you can interact with either the uh, beacon sensing device or uh, you can see the information. So, the URI beacons uh, themselves, there's loads of them around. It just uses Bluetooth. Did they buy one of them for here? Sorry? Did they buy one of them for here? They were eye beacons. Which uh, are the okay. um, these are your eye beacons. Because it's an open standard, anyone can build them. This is the official Google one. It's about that big. Um, because all it needs to do is transmit um, a special URL advertising, they call it. Uh, there's a company called Glass making really nice looking ones. Uh, the bottom corner there, it's a little uh, USB thing that you can plug on to your computer, Raspberry Pi, turn it into a beacon. Uh, Arduino shields, which are how you turn your Arduino, or I need my electronics that are tiny, tiny, and do the same thing. So that's how you can do that. So, how does it then work? This is scary for the rest of you, get a lot of smart things. So, it uses Bluetooth. So, this is the what the Bluetooth is sending out. And part A is the advertisement data, uh, which is loads of stuff. The ones we actually care about is the URI scheme and prefix and the URI suffix. It's also worth pointing out that the maximum size here is 17 bytes, so we can't actually send a lot of data. Because the way this works is you're not connecting to the Bluetooth device, um, you're, the Bluetooth device is just broadcasting it out, you're not actually pairing with anything, which means a single tiny node can actually broadcast it to millions of devices, it doesn't actually have use resource um, for connections. So, to help with that, the prefix uses a single byte with lots of little um, shorthand, so depending on what your early advertising starts with, you just set a prefix. Um, and same um, with the 17 bits that are available. For the rest of it, uh, you can use non-renderable characters and they then get expanded. And there's a whole bunch of, there's a massive table of different ones, so I'll just leave a couple of here. So the most common ones, you have .com, Fortas, and .com. So you can just insert those into the string, so you're already by a small string, can get even shorter with that. So then there's the physical web server, uh, and currently the one available that everyone seems to be using, it's just posted on some box on the app spot. There's probably going to be more official ones coming up soon, and anyone can spin up their own. Um, what the server does is it just receives a whole bunch of URLs from the client. The client scans them and just sends a whole bunch of them to the server. The server then just checks the site. It gets the title, uh, the meta title, meta description, the actual URL if it was a shortened one, and the fab icon. And that's how it then presents it. Um, in the app, so when you're looking at them, you see the title, description, and the little icon, so you can see nice results about what you're about to interact with. Um, and it does some uh, caching for a uh, fast app as well. So that's what the server currently does. You don't need to use the server, the device can do all of the resulting for you. The nice thing about using the server is you're never hitting um, the third party server before you know you want to access it. So your device isn't exposed to the third party until you decide to access it, uh, which is quite nice. And in the future, uh, by using the server model rather than doing the resolving on the client side, we can do things like we can rank devices. So at the moment, the ranking is done by signal strength. So the um, node you're closest to is the best. Uh, but in the future, if you have a crap load of nodes everywhere, there can be some algorithms to say this is actually what you actually want rather than someone's stronger signal and you can associate other metadata with it as well as this feature. Uh, so I wrote a, a Raspberry Pi beacon in uh, Node.js. Here's my two lines of code. It's really difficult um, and that's it. 
that's all you need to do, and you have a beacon. I would have brought my Raspberry Pi in to show you how it works, but uh, it requires a wired connection, and I don't have a Wi-Fi um, adapter at the moment, but I might be able to bring that in at some point. But yeah, it's really hard to put together. Uh, clients, uh, Google Play Store has an Android client, surprisingly, um, more surprisingly. There's an iOS client, and it's just a simple proof of concept one that shows you the nodes around you. Let's you connect. Uh, because it's an open standard, it's all open source, you can write your own clients, which means people like us, we can create nice clients that respect the standards but are maybe nicer designed. Maybe they have features, I like extra features and stuff like that. The last thing is the most important one for me is the idea is that this is standard. So you go around, you don't need an app to connect to a Wi Fi network and you don't need an app to connect to um, a Bluetooth or something like that. It's all baked into the operating system. If this is a standard that gets accepted uh, widely, is it could come built in to your phone. So your phone just then be able to um, access all of these things immediately, which is great. So what can we do with it? I said earlier, information. So bus stops, train stations, museums, you're here, maps, theme parks, wherever. You could go into somewhere and It'll be like, oh, I've got some info about where you currently are. You click it and you get the kind of bus stop, you know, timetables or the train timetables, things like that. Museums, you could have one per room and you could pull up a little site that has information about the current room. Uh, interaction, parking meters, vending machines, rental cars, um, bikes, uh, and restaurant food room. Um, all those nice little things which currently you kind of need an app for. Um, and it'd just be really handy. And these are some of the most interesting ones I've only got to. And these are little use cases that this technology kind of makes possible that weren't previously possible. Things like you could have a little URI beacon in your pet's collar, and if that pet get, uh, gets lost and someone um, with a beacon, they can go, oh, there's a link to call the owner um, from that, which is really nice. Or if you work in um, manufacturing and you have big um, uh, equipment, they could send out your diagnostics. So you go in there and say, oh, what's the pressure oil or whatever, what's the statistics of it and stuff like that. So they can advertise themselves, um, which is really nice. And you can get involved with all of this stuff. So um, that's the official site, which also has links to their GitHub. This is a uh, shameless uh, self-plug here. Uh, I wrote a blog post about this. If you have a Raspberry Pi, this is basically step by step on how you can set up your own little demo that sets up a Raspberry Pi and, and put physical web. And you can then um, go on to access that device and control an LED and on there from your phone without having to install anything, which is really cool. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. No questions? Good. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. No, that was good at me. Um, that was my official review. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was sitting down with Greg going through a brief he had the other day around this um, this pet thing actually, where you've got like this system in a, in a user's home, uh, which basically uh, dispenses treats for the pet, um, and then they can sort of fire up notifications to the user's mobile and all that sort of stuff. So it'd be similar sort of that the base, basic approach that you do to do that because it's triggering something. <coughs> Yeah, it's, you can, that's not the main use case for this, but yes, you could write a client and when it recognizes that something has come in the range of the beacon, it, it can automatically do stuff. Um, I think that probably sounds more like a custom solution. Yeah, I know, it's, it's more, it's, yeah, yeah, it's not just sort of straight information that's getting pushed no. out in it somehow, yeah. Yeah, this is much more about uh, um, service discovery. So you go into somewhere and you go and go, ooh, I can control the lights in here with this and things like that. Yeah. Do you think that as like more stuff becomes, like in the physical world, becomes more closely related to stuff on the web, 
web security is going to become a lot more important because obviously if my lights are hooked up to the internet and someone like gets in there and just starts fucking around like <laughs> like, or like a, like a so big machine just like spitting out Mars bars <laughs> on the street or something like that like people are going to start to really pay attention to oh yeah absolutely um I think there's we're constantly moving towards that whether it's um people's um, people can connect to using physical web, yeah. um, but everything's being connected to the internet, um, washing machines, mm -hmm. um, there's that um, egg holder for your yeah. fridge, it's connected. Can you imagine if someone had the egg holder? <laughs> oh, yeah. I've got all these eggs that I need to. The Amazon button. The Amazon oh yeah, button. the quick button that you've got to stick on everything. Mm. Oh my god, someone's definitely going to make a hack that just presses all of them in your house. The ones that they're outside. Like, yeah, it's called the pump. Just orders so, so much stuff. They get like, twenty drones like flying all these things into your house or something. What's the limita limitation on Bluetooth range? Um, I think it's about twenty to thirty foot. Is it? Yeah, which is pretty decent. So you, know, you go into a McDonald's or something like that, you whip up your phone and make your order there. Which is some of the cool case studies that. I'd like um, to happen from technology like this is I don't want to stand in a queue somewhere. I know I, I go in there, I can make my order, and then they say, oh, the 46 is ready. So, so and currently, it just chucks out a URL. Yeah, so it chucks out Do you reckon soon you'll be able to know who? So if I go past this room here, and it pings me that I come back again 20 minutes later. I want that to know that I've already been pinged once. Um, it on purpose doesn't do that. Um, it doesn't do user tracking um, at all. So that this isn't um, for. It's more if I get just sent an offer. But the thing is, the offer will only be available when you're in the range. So you're walking past the shop, for instance, and if I go ding, and then you realize, ooh, step in for a first or something like that. Take the offer up, and then walk back out, back in again. Again. Yeah. What's the main difference between like eye beacons and, and these? What, what's the so the eye beacon stuff is all very much, which you can do with this as well, but it's all very much based on um, your eye beacon. They're not transmitting URLs; they're just transmitting their locations, yeah. Yeah. and you can then say, oh, you know, there's uh, that and that eye beacon in that direction, and if my app knows about that beacon, yeah. then it's more it's just giving. The, the device a sense of where it is. Yeah, and you can obviously program it to be something like I know this IP beacon's ID and my yeah. app knows how to do something with that. Yeah. Whereas this is more like it doesn't know what I, to do with I, it, but it sends you off there to do yeah. what you want it to do. Yeah, it's a, yeah. it's basically just a way for devices to advertise their own yeah. services.